two, one, we're live. Well, welcome everybody. It's time for the kidneys and the heart. Sorry for a short delay. We had some technical glitches. We're uh, learning all as we go. Um, one of the things that um, I got to stop doing is not touching my face when I'm wearing my mask. Um, and we have lots to talk about uh, today. Um, remember, if you're having trouble with technology, let us know. We have the email drkernu at 232gmail.com. And we'll get somebody to help you. Um, uh, right now, Sonia um, and Maria and Teresa have been calling people and helping people with technology. And just, just now, um, we just had some technology problems. See, we're all learning. So, you know, today the issue about kidneys and, and the heart, are they connected or not, and how that becomes important. This is really quite crucial. We know that, um, um, you know, that all these things work well together. And uh, we're going to spend some time exploring because people say, what about what to do with my kidneys, what to do with my heart, diabetes, we're going to explore that. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please, that would be great. We'll see a few things that happened this week. Um, and, you know, um, one of the things is that, you know, my battle with weight, um, I'm now down to, hey, Paul, how much do you think I weigh now? I'm going to say one... 71. Yeah, I weigh 171. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we're actually going to be playing tennis tomorrow morning at 6 or in the morning. We're going to be at um, Linden Park, and people want to come join us. We're going to have a bike ride at 11 o'clock, both Saturday and Sunday. Last week, uh, Paul came out and joined us, and uh, he uh, did 50 kilometers, and uh, we were chasing him. We couldn't catch him, but uh, he let us catch up to him, so we 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 did some good, um, and uh, we have some really good tennis players and some bad tennis players, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and so uh, so one of the things is that how do you keep yourself young? Keep moving. Keep moving. Um, can you advance the slide by any chance? Maybe not. Um, Andy, can you go to the next slide? So we're going to try to advance the slide. Um, and so, so to me, uh, you know, is that uh, how do we measure kidney function? Well, we're going to learn, learn about something called GFR, creatinine. We're going to learn about, you know, when your car leaks oil, uh, leaks protein. Um, when the kidneys leak oil. And so this is this is week. Uh, this is this week. So this on the on the far left. This is actually Judy. Judy's been with us for about four years now, and uh, she uh, is just finishing off what's, uh, she's starting medical school in Toronto, um, and uh, she, and, uh, and so, uh, so she got my autographed copy of Three Days to Help See Her You, um, and uh, on your far right, we have one of our uh, patients in his garden, so to me, having a garden, it should be one of our priorities, you can see that the mass of the week, um, and then, um, we had sushi this week, and um, uh, Dino was a guy who plays squash and now tennis. He's also a, a sushi chef, so um, uh, he made us some, um, some 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 nice sushi. Now he tried using brown rice, but it didn't work out for him, so we were stuck with white rice. But uh, never say no, and uh, so one of my favorite foods are, are, are sushi here. So think of ways of being healthier, and um, and that's an example. Next slide, please. So my encouragement to everybody is get yourself a garden. Um, so can we, can we advance the slide by any chance? Hey, um, okay. Okay. That's okay. So let's, so we're going to see if we can play a, uh, a video here at that place. This is actually, I'll be quiet for a second. Here's a counter stick. Could you just tell me how you felt before the transplant? Yeah, it was really just a lethargic, lazy, nothing left in the tank. I think my dad and mom thought I was the laziest person in the world. So there's a lot of just lying around. From a little low, low energy. Did you feel nauseous throwing up at all? Yeah. Mm. Food didn't taste good. It's, you just feel like nothing going in out. Did you feel short of breath at all? Uh, over time, yeah. You just kind of slowly degrade and do less and less. Legs full at all or anything? Yeah. And uh, so were you able to pass your energy? Did you lose the ability to pass your energy at all? And by the end it was very limited. And then down into dialysis and you were limited to... 
a small amount of water each day. So you're on dialysis for how long? Uh, for just about a year. What was that like? Um, it is not a fun experience. You know, people, you think that you're going to feel better. I mean, you feel better than maybe your lowest point prior to, but not much. You can live, but it's not like your best quality of life. So the, the king does amazing things. One of the things that eliminates waste products, it, it, it takes care of acid base status, it prevents anemia, mm -hmm. um, eliminates salt, potassium, minerals. So it really causes a lot of problems. And once kidney failure gets very bad, uh, many people can lose the ability to pass urine. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, and there are some people on dialysis who pass no urine. Some pass limits amount. And you're sounds like you're getting to that point. Yeah. Right. So, uh, first of all, being on dialysis, there's no cup of tea. No. And, uh, and But it's better than, than the alternative for some people. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, is that when the kidneys fail in older people, let's say, who have blocked arteries, who have had strokes, atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, all sorts of comorbidities, it, uh, sometimes it can be a blessing um, that, you know, you pass away um, more peacefully, um, but also, it, it's also, for other people, it's, it's a life saver. In your case, tell me after the heart, or the heart, tell me after the kidney transplant, what was that like? I just, it was mind-blowing. Um, you go into it, and like, you've degraded over time, you don't always realize how much worse you're getting. You know, you're not, you know you're not great, but you don't quite feel it because it's such a gradual change. And I remember within three, four days after the transplant, you feel like a new person. And you're just shocked that like, yeah, you're still feeling, but it's just unbelievable how much better every part of your life feels so fast. And for me, it was a big eye opener on like how powerful that kidney and how big healthy kidney function is. So we measure kidney function to the code GFR. Do you know that terminology at all? A little bit, yeah. Okay. Do you remember what your GFR was at the time of the failure at all? I don't. I remember them talking creatinine numbers. And I, yeah, it was, a, oh, it was around 900, I think, that I finally went into dialysis. So, so normal creatinine is around 90 or so, and the lower the number, the worse off. Um, um, so a normal creatinine is a, you know, less than 100, less than 90 to 100, it depends up on muscle mass. but yeah. 900 is, means that your GFR, or the filtration of kidneys, is very low, much less than 50%. And, uh, and so you're just hanging in there. Wiles has obviously filtered the kidneys, and that was helpful for, for a while. But uh, kidney transplants is a miracle. There's not enough kidneys to go around. So one of the things that we all think about is that uh, I, if I don't need my kidneys, you can have you know, organ transplantation. So I'm always grateful for people to do that. So when my time comes, anything they can Harvest, welcome to it. So that's why. So I encourage people to fill out that donor card, make your wish known about that. Um, and uh, some of the ways to prevent chronic renal failure is know your blood pressure. Don't be overweight, lose weight. Don't smoke. Control your diabetes. Control blood pressure. Control your cholesterol. These are so important. Now you had a different form of an injury to your kidneys, but the most common is blocked arteries. And we now have a very strong interaction between kidney function. And heart condition. And most people will have kidney failure. It's a progressive. They won't go into stage dialysis, but they, 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 they won't feel well, they won't feel well for all sorts of reasons. Uh, they're deconditioned, they don't, don't look after themselves, they can't exercise, they're sick. The part of it is that I, what I encourage people to do is really be exercising, know your blood pressure, know your cholesterol, know your numbers. Most people who go into renal failure don't realize they have no fun failure, it's really far advanced. So the time you are feeling sick, the disease is very far from advanced. So, yeah. But now we're keeping you healthy, your blood pressure is under control, you require medication for that, lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. I'm still worried about your triglyceride. <laughs> yeah. So much look at those videos. Yeah. I still want you to join us for our summer events. Yeah. So please work hard to protect those kidneys. Mm -hmm. Well, that was an interesting conversation. We just had that uh, today. and. Uh, we're going to learn about a little bit what this means, what things like. So creatinine is one of the measurements of uh, kidney function. Um, so to me, is that we want to just keep talking about kidney function. So one of the things is that the creatinine is one measurement, and that the higher the creatinine, the worse the kidney function is. Um, but we also measure the called GFR, glomerular filtration rate, which is a more precise measurement. And that shows that um, the lower the uh, GFR, the worse the kidney function is.
Now, one of the things is that kidneys eliminate waste products. One of the, the, the issues here is congestive heart failure. And one of the things is I see as a heart doctor, you're short of breath, you have ankle swelling. And I have this list in front of me about symptoms of congestive heart failure. You, you can't breathe probably. You get short of breath going upstairs. Your legs are swollen. You, you're coughing. So that can be all sorts of reasons about that that can be an issue when it, when it, when it comes to that. So... Um, Really important. Um, I'm not sure if we can, uh, so so we can actually measure. And this is the one appreciation how we measure. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and how we also measure the uh, kidney function is that uh, we look at for, for heart failure. What we see is the heart doesn't pump properly. They're going to try to fix the slides over here. They're, they're doing something in the background. So we're going to just keep talking about this. So you know, heart failure and kidney disease are, are well mixed together. They, they mix and match. And, uh, you know, when the heart doesn't work well, uh, you get shorter breaths. And we, we saw this gentleman here that uh, wasn't feeling well. And it's for all, all sorts of reasons. He wasn't feeling well because his kidneys <clears throat> weren't working. Um, and then it can affect the heart and, uh, and how it affects the heart, this interaction. And you can see that you can't exercise, so your muscles get weak, you get depressed, you get sad, you may have smoked in your lifetime, you have some underlying lung disease, so there's going to be so many reasons for this for this to not work too well. And, uh, um, and it just leads to shortness of breaths. In fact, when I think of shortness of breaths, what are some of the reasons it could be? Um, so I think first look at the heart. What I'm seeing right now, and I just saw a patient just talking to him, is that uh, today, at about a month ago, he was admitted to the hospital, and he was in respiratory failure. He had a rise in his carbon dioxide level, and he was on a respirator. Now, for your body not to eliminate carbon dioxide means the lungs are, are pretty bad. Now, he smoked for, you know, early in life. It got better as time goes on. Um but your lungs age and you're going to catch up to you. And we see that, well, 10% of people will develop severe renal insufficiency. Um, it's a growing disease, as we're going to learn about. As, as we're living longer, we have more chronic illness. So, so to me, is how do you keep the, the, the body from aging too quickly is that, um, and I think what this COVID-19 pandemic has is allowed us to understand is that unfortunately COVID-19 tends to kill people uh, that are older. I got that. But also kills people who have poor risk factor control, such as diabetes. And you can see that diabetes has exploded um, if you have high blood pressure. And by the way, if you have high blood pressure, we did a really wonderful video recently about the management of, of high blood pressure. So I encourage you to look at that and to measure blood pressure, uh, it's one of the causes of reversible congestive heart failure. Remember, if you lower your systolic blood pressure by about 10 millimeters of mercury, which is easily achieved with uh, one agent, maybe two agents for blood pressure, you can decrease the amount of congestive heart failure up to 40%. You actually protect the kidneys so the kidneys live long. You prevent heart attacks and especially strokes. So that's important. And, um, and to me, is that uh, we were all struggling with weight. I understand how challenging it is right now, and uh, my weight has been a problem. Um, but I'm trying to make it less of a problem. And uh, and one of the consequences of the problem is that your heart can't pump or it gets stiff over time. I'll see if we can advance the slides at this stage. Um, we'll see how that looks. And uh, again, I think you saw this before, is that heart failure is now becoming a problem in people who have kidney problems because you can't eliminate the salt in the water. It puts more pressure on the system. And as we get older, uh, the, the heavier you are, the more high blood pressure. You have rhythm problems such as atrial fibrillation becomes a problem. We can look at that. So um, I'm just seeing this avalanche of shortness of breaths, people, and congestive heart failure and associated with kidney disease is a huge problem. Next slide, please. Um, you can see this interaction with the heart. The heart we hear in isolation, but it's really dependent on its environment. So we're going to explore the connection between 
heart disease and kidney disease. So a question I'm going to ask, um, I'm not sure, Stuart or, or Paul, is that uh, I'll ask Paul this question. So Paul's over here. Come over, come join us here for a second. And here's Heather, and here's Heather over here. So if you have bad kidneys, um, what are you going to die of? It could be of kidney failure? What do you think, Heather? Bad kidney. Yeah, you have bad kidneys. So yeah, your, 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 your kidney function is at 10% or 20% normal. What are you going to die of? Yeah, you're gonna divide, you're gonna die of heart disease. So um, you 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 really well. First of all, we can dialyze people. Um, you go on dialysis. So dialysis is is um, is quite a difficult um, process. It's it's made easier, but it's not an easy process. And what, what we learned is that most patients with end, rate, end stage renal disease will die of their heart, and uh, and that's because the kidney is very vascular for blood supply, and just as the heart. So if you damage blood vessels to your heart, you get you have heart disease, you damage to your legs, you get blocked arteries in your legs and amputations. Blocked arteries to neck, you have stroke. Blocked arteries to your kidneys, your kidneys don't work. Um, next slide, please. So the heart tries to compensate, and this slide just reminds me of, uh, if you can just advance the slide a little bit over here, is that a pulse show that's really importantly is that know your blood pressure. So I'm tired when people say, um, I don't know my blood pressure. I don't at the pharmacy. You should know. No. You should know your blood pressure. Paul, what's the best place to take your blood pressure? Uh, at home. At home, relax. And you know, I'm calling people today to I'll do my blood pressure now. It's too late. You want to measure blood pressure in a relaxed environment before the doctor called, not the doctor's office. Look at this. For every 10 millimeters reduction in blood pressure, Decrease heart disease by 20%, heart failure by 30%, stroke by 30%. So know your blood pressure, measure your blood pressure, take care of your blood pressure. Next slide. It also damages your kidneys, as we're going to learn about. So um, now there's other causes of shorter breaths. We're all short of breath. This is an example I learned this, this week about interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. That's the doctor's job to figure this out. So not all shortness of breaths is heart disease, not all shortness of breaths. Uh, is lung disease, not all shortness of breath, is kidney disease or deconditioning or anemia. But this is an example that we're learning about scarring in the heart, the, the lungs from pulmonary fibrosis. So this is an example that uh, very specific. We look for, we use CAT scans to help us make that diagnosis. Next slide, please. This is a slide to look at called, uh, do I need a bypass operation? Now, this is a landmark changing trial. You've seen the slide before. You're going to see it again on multiple occasions. We're going to spend a lot more time discussing of this. So if I have blocked arteries, should I go for surgery or angioplasty or medical therapy? What do you think? Well, it turns out there's no difference. If you have something called stable angina, you have serious blockages of your heart, you're not going to live longer by going for an, for an angioplasty or bypass surgery. I'm going to repeat myself. For 90% of people who have blocked arteries, having an angioplasty or bypass operation makes you feel better, but doesn't make you live longer. And the first curve shows in the first two years, you're more likely to have a heart attack because you take vessels, you're trying to repair them, you damage them. So to me, next slide please. The most important thing about heart disease prevention is this 500 stuff you need to do over here. Um, so from knowing your cholesterol, lowering your blood pressure, that's the important thing is medical therapy. So um, after this tonight, uh, there's Heather and Paul. We're going to go out for the walk on the Shadok steps. And anybody wants to come join us afterwards, half an hour after this presentation, we're going to go on the Shadok steps. And if, if that's too late for you, at 6.30 tomorrow morning, I'm playing tennis in Linden Park. Come join myself and, and Dino. And I think Ocean is, is a five-year-old daughter is going to be there. And uh, Gaten's coming. He's a real good tennis player then. So, uh, but um, at 11 o'clock, after a few phone calls tomorrow morning, we're going we're gonna to go for a bike ride. So to me, um, uh, this COVID-19 has taught me what's important. Uh, I'm losing weight. I'm exercising. I'm enjoying spending time with everybody. Uh, you're all invited. Uh, if it rains tomorrow morning, maybe we'll, we'll cancel the, uh, the event. But we're going to do this uh, most of the time. Please join us. And optimizing is optimizing. I know how hard it is, but it's kind of fun too as well. 
I work hard, but I, I, I also find time to, to look after myself. Uh, next slide. So we're going to talk about how the kidneys fit into this picture here. And if you walk away with one message, if you have a kidney problem, We'll, sh we'll show you how you can improve things in a little bit and how, 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 how to help them. But more importantly, if you have kidney disease, you're probably going to die of heart disease. Um, next slide, please. Now, I'm very privileged to get all sorts of medical information. And this, this video summarizes quite a few things. We'll just start this video, if we may. This is actually from, uh, um, if, this is actually from something called um, PACE, which is really... So when we talk about... Go ahead chronic kidney disease, it's very important to appreciate the chronic kidney disease means more than just end-stage kidney disease, dialysis and transplantation. We need to appreciate that chronic kidney disease is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events, as reflected in clinical trials as MACE, an increase in sudden death and an increase in all-cause mortality. Furthermore, we are increasingly appreciating the close link between chronic kidney disease and heart failure and also the increased risk of drug reactions, adverse side effects from different medications given to these people. Chronic kidney disease is a major epidemic, probably occurs in up to 10% of the population of which the majority, almost 90%, are not aware that they have chronic kidney disease. And we know that the major causes of chronic kidney disease worldwide are diabetes and hypertension. And chronic kidney disease is increasingly a major cause of death in the community. So, for example, in 1990, it was number 24 in the world. In 2007, it was number 16. And probably in the next 20 years, it will go up to being the fifth commonest cause of death in the world and will be about two places above diabetes, which is also an increasing cause of death. So the issue of diabetes and chronic kidney disease is an increasingly important clinical problem. Indeed, if we look at all the chronic kidney disease in the world, diabetes represents over 40% of chronic kidney disease. And in many parts of the world, particularly in Asia, it's now more than half all the people with end-stage kidney disease. So let's look at how we treat people with diabetic kidney disease. And we now consider multifactorial intervention as the mainstay of treatment. We focus on glucose control, blood pressure, particularly blockade of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We know that there is important evidence for weight loss and diet being useful. And finally, blood lipid lowering is very important, albeit mostly for reducing the associated cardiovascular rather than kidney disease. And we will hear more about that in the talk that follows mine. So let's look at the data for glucose lowering. And if we look at two of the major trials in type 2 diabetes, the ADVANCE trial on the left and the ACCORD tri trial on the right, you can see that with intensive glucose control, we do not see a very impressive effect on serum creatinine in the total population. However, the advanced study did show if you aggressively treat people and follow them for at least five years, you will see at least a 50% reduction in cumulative end-stage kidney disease. We've been very fortunate to follow up these patients in the advance on trial and have confirmed in the Zungus paper in the New England Journal this persistence of benefit of glucose lowering on end-stage kidney disease. The mainstay of treatment for preventing end-stage renal disease over the last 20 years is based on the seminal studies published almost 20 years ago with the renal angiotensin blockers. And I show you here the data from the renal study with losartan, and there was similar data in the IDNT with herbisartan, showing for the first time a specific treatment could reduce the risk of end-stage kidney disease by more than 20%. But since that time, till very recently, there were no new treatments that showed renal protection and benefits. Now, a question that is often asked is what is the benefit of diet and lifestyle? And in the look-ahead study, you can see here 
the Darden lifestyle, although this was primarily a cardiovascular trial, was associated with some renal benefits, a modest decrease of about 20% in the number of people who end up with low GFR, less than 45 mils per minute, and a tendency, albeit not statistical, for a reduction in renal replacement therapy and doubling of serum creatinine. So I've shown you a range of treatments that might be helpful for diabetic kidney disease, but we know that we don't treat people in isolation. And so what, as I mentioned earlier, we need to look at the role of multifactorial intervention. So here in the STEN02 trial, which was performed more than 20 years ago, seven to eight years of intensive treatment at the end of the study, at the eight-year time point, showed no clear-cut benefit on GFR. But if you follow these people for another 13 years, we see a benefit. It's small but statistically significant. There was a benefit, a long-term legacy of early aggressive treatment in reducing the rate of decline in GFR. However, the effects on albuminuria were more transient. As you can see in the shaded left side, the blue area, during the active time of the study, there was a reduction in urinary albumin excretion. But over time, when patients returned to their normal treatment, urinary albumin ended up returning to the normal range. So that is a glimpse or some evidence about how to treat kidney. So what I learned from this is that kidney disease represents about 10% of a major issue for, for many of us. It seems to me in, in the practice that I see, most of us have some degree of kidney dysfunction and as kidneys age, we're going to learn a lot more about this. And uh, there are steps that you can do from certain medications, being aware of the diagnosis and certain lifestyle changes. So um, one, of, one of the ways that we measure kidney function is, is through albumin and one is through measuring a blood test. I learned a little bit more about that. So. We assembled a team of two wonderful young ladies who are going to tell us a little bit what to do about the kidneys. And uh, so let's hear from you guys. Hi guys, I'm Devon Shee and I'll get started. Um, so basically, where are the kidneys located? Um, the kidneys are located in the abdomen along the back and they you know, basically lie against the posterior abdominal wall. Uh, where the upper parts of the kidneys, as you can see, are going to be protected um, by the ribs. The right and left kidneys are paired, but they are not at the same level. And the reason for that is because the right kidney is slightly pushed by the liver that is right above the right kidney, um, which then pushes the right kidney down, and that's why it is uh, slightly lower than the left kidney. In terms of the shape, when we look at the kidney, it's about the size of a bar of bath soap, where the lateral surface is convex or curved outwards, and then the medial of the kidney is concave or curved um, inwards. And then the medial part of the kidney also has a slit that's called the helium, which basically that's where the vessels and nerves will enter and exit. And the kidney is also covered or protected by three connective tissues. And it's just there to protect against, you know, any sort of trauma or any um, act as or act as a shock absorber. In terms of the blood circulation, um, kidneys are only about 0.4% of our body weight, but they actually receive 21% of the cardiac output, or 21% of the total amount of blood that is uh, pumped out of the heart. And the blood then will come towards the kidney via the renal arteries and will leave um, the kidney via the renal veins. And this blood flow, you know, it, it, it not only um, returns useful things back to the blood, or, but it also removes harmful waste products and excretes it out. And these, this waste product will then go through uh, the kidney, which will then go to the uterine and then the urinary uh, bladder and then uh, the urethra and then will be excreted out as urine. Next slide, please. Hey, um, so I'll continue to talk about the structure of kidney. So kidneys are basically uh, made up of smaller units called nephrons. Um, and it, if you can see the picture here, so that shows the picture of what a nephron looks like microscopically. Um, each of our kidneys have over a million nephrons. And nephrons essentially work as filtering units inside our kidney. So this is exactly where all the action takes place. 
So blood and urine both run parallel to each other and different toxins from the blood are removed and pushed inside the urine and any nutrients that we still want the blood to take back are taken back inside the blood and sent back to our entire body. So that's how we basically maintain the level of fluids and electrolytes in our body as well as ensure that no nutrients which are important are lost um, and nephrons play that filtering role. Um, now there's many different things that can damage the nephrons and when nephrons start to damage then you start seeing its impact on kidney function and that is essentially when we say that our kidneys are getting damaged. This is the part that actually gets damaged. Um, it can be damaged by both acute and chronic insults. So acute will be something um, that just happened like trauma or any significant um, drug impact or other toxins that can create an acute effect. Um, and something chronic will be like a chronic condition that you've had for a longer time. So that would be like diabetes or hypertension that slowly builds its effect and slowly leads to damage of your nephrons. Next slide. Um, so basically, just a little bit about the kidney function. Sorry, next slide. Um, in terms of the kidney functions, you know, the kidney plays a very important role in terms of blood volume, um, blood pressure, and the composition of blood. Um, but its number, main, number one job, or the main job, is to filter blood and excrete any type of toxic or met metabolic waste that might be present. And after the filtration of that blood, um, some of the waste product is then formed um, from, because of the metabolism, which will then need to be removed um, by the kidneys. They are also responsible for electrolyte balance and plasma pH for acid-base balance. And any dysfunction of the kidneys, like Dr. Perna mentioned, will also affect the cardiovascular system. Next slide, please. Um, so we mentioned that uh, kidneys do a lot of different things for us. So it's very important to constantly monitor how well our kidneys are functioning. Um, and there's many different ways that um, people use in order to uh, measure kidney function. Um, and so for the next few slides, we'll just go over a couple different ways that you can measure kidney function. Um, one of them being the creatinine values. So, so creatinine is I essentially. Just pause, I just pause for one quick second. You just go back one slide. I want to just. I just want to just highlight something here. Now, this is a very technical talk because the kidneys are very technical. So the the, the, the kidneys are composed of about two million filters, um, and they regulate your electrolytes, your your acid base status. You know, if your potassium is too high, you're going to die. If you if you get too much acid in your bloodstream, you're going to die. Uh, it's just amazing. It also regulates the amount of part of the hemoglobin, the, 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 the blood count. And it has so many effects. It's, so, it's just, you know, it's, so it's a filter, but it's also, it does a lot more. Um, I, I just, I'm just totally amazed at this organ system. It, it just, 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 you know, like, um, in the time you have a problem, you lost too much of it, and it's too late for, for many of us. So, um, this is just, just truly, truly amazing how, how, how the body works. And I, I, I'm just, uh, I'm always taken away from it. And I just learned yesterday, I, I forgot this. When I was in medical school, school is that if you're starving, um, your kidneys will take down, break down products from, from protein, from muscle, and uh, make them to sugar. Um, so um, it's a lifesaver in so many ways. So um, I, I just want to pause. I, I, wow. Um, um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Next slide. Go ahead. Sorry. Have you already measured now? Tell me how you measure this stuff. Yes. Um, so essentially, as Dr. Quinney was saying, there's multiple different things that our kidneys do. And so it's very important that we um, have a good system to check how the kidneys are doing. Um, so one of the things that we use is um, creatinine protein. So kidneys, along with a lot of other things, help with filtering of different nutrients, including protein. And so how well do they filter versus how much we can retain that um, gives a good indication of how well our kidneys are functioning. So creatinine is a protein which is produced when our muscles break down. So our muscles are constantly being breaking down and built up as we go throughout the day. Um, and so when creatinine is produced, it travels to our blood and goes to the kidneys where it is filtered. 
Um, and essentially, the amount of creatinine that gets filtered um, helps us identify how well our kidneys are doing. So normally, um, all the creatinine, creatinine that goes to the kidneys passes through the fenestrations and then it gets reabsorbed back. So when we look at our normal values, the creatinine values um, in the blood should be between 0.8 to 1.8 grams per day for males. Um, and then in Canadian units, it'll be between 7 to 16. Um, and then it slightly varies for females. Um, but when you have higher creatinine values, then it will suggest that our kidneys are not doing their function right. They're not able to filter the amount of creatinine that you have to. And therefore, creatinine starts to build up. Um, so some things that can influence this could be something that's very temporary. So if you are dehydrated or if you've had a very high protein diet that has produced excess creatinine, that might be an indication. But if you've had a, if this occurs for a chronic period of time, like if you had an infection or diabetes or cardiovascular disease, then buildup of creatinine could in, could um, essentially point to a more severe damage to your kidneys. So I think in simple terms is that one measurement of kidney function is just your creatinine and it's reflection of muscle mass and how the filter was working. So somewhere between 80 to 100 for most people is a normal value. When it starts to go above 100, uh, we start to get, get concerned. But also it depends on your muscle mass. So if you're a bigger person, you have a higher value. If you're a thinner person, you have less muscle mass. So it's crude. It's a good starting point. And uh, thank you for sharing that. And so that's the first thing. We'll get more precise on how to measure kidney function. So uh, if you remember one thing is look at your creatinine. The lower the number, the better off you are on average. Anything above 100 for most people um, is reasonable. As you get older, that number changes because you have less muscle mass. But... Uh, that's a good starting point. Thank you. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, so as Dr. Kruny was saying, creatinine is just one of the starting points. Um, something else that we use traditionally that is something that you would have also heard in more clinical settings is the glomerular filtration rate or GFR and EGFR, which is the estimated value for your glomerular filtration rate. So what this is, it's an indication of the clinic, uh, again, kidney function, and it essentially tells us how well the kidney is being able to filter the creatinine. So since we cannot directly measure a glomerular filtration rate, it is often calculated based on the amount of creatinine values. There's a very complicated formula to do that, but essentially based on the blood creatinine value, your age, your body size, and gender, we have an estimated EGFR, which is calculated. And then the normal in that EGFR range is between 100 to 130 mils. And then for women, it's between 90 to 120 mils. Again, this takes into consideration your age, your body size, and your gender. So there's many different factors which can influence your filtration rate. So this is a slide that I that, that I put in. So to remind myself is that uh, we have different stages of kidney dysfunction. So normal fit kidney function, a GFR, or estimate GFR greater than 90, and there's different ways of calculating, but uh, most labs will actually give you an estimated GFR. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. So it's over 90, that's good. And you can see stage five is less than 15. I, I, I sort of round off the numbers a little bit. So I think 90 is being 100%, and I think a 15, about 15%. Not totally true, but good enough. So you can see you know, 60 to 89, 50 to 60, 30 to 45 range. So that gives you an approximation what your kidney function is in a young, healthy person. Problem, as we age, we do lose nephrons, and uh, as we age, we lose a lot of things. And uh, so I, I find this table really helpful. On the other side, which you're going to see, I'm going to talk a little bit more, is that is your car leaks, leaks oil. If your kidneys leak, it leaks albumin, protein. Those, so those are some numbers there. And very importantly is that we're going to talk about this many times. It's something called sad man. So what do you do when you get acute injury to your, your kidneys? So you're dehydrated, you're, you're nauseous, you're vomiting, you can't eat or, or drink. And that really will 
cause in some people acute rise in their 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 um, creatinine or fall in GFR. Remember, the higher the creatinine, the worse off you are, and the lower your GFR, the worse off you are. So these are just numbers that just give reflection of kidney function. So one thing I want people to remember if that if I have a diabetic and I'm taking uh, a medic category is a medication called sulfonylurea. It's the most common one right now is dimicron. Or I'm taking metformin that I'm not eating and drinking. I should actually measure my blood sugar much more carefully, much more often, uh, and and put those medications on hold. Same thing is that my blood pressure may be low at that point in time. So I measure my blood pressure like a good patient should, a good individual should, and. Everybody I know in this room has their own blood pressure machines and one for every room in the house. Um, but uh, every, everybody, you know, so if you really want to look after yourself, you have to, you have to monitor things. So ACE inhibition, ARB therapies, uh, angiotensin receptor. So ACE is something like Ramipril, Perindopril, Covercil. Angiotensin receptors are some examples are um, Atacand, Candesart, and uh, Losartan, so all the sartans in the world. Very important is that anti-inflammatories, non-steroid anti-inflammatories, those are things like Aleve, Naproxen, um, those are, are, are harmful to the kidneys. And to me, if you have a GFR less than 30, you should not take them at all. Um, um, and I try to use as little as possible. I may be taking two Naproxen or three Naproxen total a year. Uh, I, or I I don't want to take things that have potential damage for my kidneys, but when I'm having a bad ache or pain, um, you have to look at that. And the other category of drugs we're going to talk about is SGL2 receptor antagonists. These are very specific drugs that uh, are good to protect the kidneys, but if you're dehydrated, they can do uh, they can do some harm. So I want you to people to think about this and to think about when to stop medications uh, for a short period of time till you're back on your feet. And don't remember if you're not feeling well, drinking water is a, is a great starting point. And I'm a big fan of two glasses of water for every meal for most people. And uh, if you want to lose five pounds, have two glasses of water before every meal. It'll help fill you up a little bit. Uh, uh, so that helps a little bit with the hydration. It's more salt that's the hydration, but uh, uh, water is uh, not a bad food. for. It's actually the best number one beverage uh, for all of us. Um, so I'm not sure if you want anything more to that slide or just move on to the next one there. That's the slide I just threw in there because I thought that was how my brain thinks. And this on the, on the, on the top part is looking at the, the protein loss along the way in both American and Canadian units. Um, um, so, um, um, that's what I want to say about that slide. Any, any other thoughts at all? There you go. Never mind. You go, go to your slide. Um. So yeah, we're still considering the same EGFR and the protein. So I think this is like a good extension. Um, so if you look at the image here, it helps identify um, how much of your G GFR values will help predict your kidney function. So if you look at the different stages here, stage one indicates that your GFR values are 90% or higher. And when that happens, then you have a great kidney function. But as we go down the stages, so let's say if we go to stage 3A, which is mild to moderate loss of kidney function, the EGFR reduces. So as we talked about previously, lower the EGFR, lower your kidney function. So we can see how that correlates to the percent of kidney function, which reduces from about 90 to 100 to 59 to 45 percent. And as we progress down to last stage, which is the kidney failure stage 5, um, then our kidney function is less than 15%. So that basically um, indicates how a majority of our nephrons inside the kidney have died, and so no longer it will be able to do its normal filtering function as well as other functions. Um, so when that happens, essentially, um, the kidney, so kidney has a great meshwork where it helps to prevent um, some particles from moving through and it allows the others to filter. So that allows the kidneys to exactly take out things that we don't need and retain the things that we need. But when the kidneys are damaged, when the nephrons are damaged, then those that meshwork sort of falls apart and we have more gaps that form, which allows a lot of leakage to occur. So one thing that normally gets leaked out is excess protein. 
um, and that protein is usually in the form of albumin. Um, so when you have more than the normal amount of protein coming out in your urine, then we term that as proteinuria. So normal values, your amount of albumin that's released outside daily should be less than 30 milligrams. Um, and then in proteinuria, you have over 500 milligrams, which is excreted in your urine. So that just indicates a lot of kidney damage that might have happened. Um, yeah. So, and there's different, sorry. So, I think you illustrate very nicely that there's two ways of looking at kidneys. One is the GFR, the filtration of the kidneys, and also the leakage of protein. Um, and so that's actually, uh, you have to look at both of them. They tell us little bits of information that are different, but they're complementary too as well. I guess my analogy is I always think of proteinuria as your car leaking oil. Um, and when your kidneys are leaking, they leak basically albumin. Go ahead. Go to the next slide then. Um, so this is one of the other ways which are commonly used to, again, measure your kidney function. And this essentially combines both the proteins that we've initially mentioned, so both albumin and creatinine, and it creates a ratio of albumin to creatinine, and it gives a better indication of how well your kidneys are doing. Um, so you do a urine spot sample, and then on that spot sample, they essentially attest for a ratio of albumin over creatinine. And then normal values are usually a ratio of less than 30 milligrams per milliliter. Um, if you are leaking out albumin, um, and if it is not that big of a kidney damage, then you have something called microalbuminuria. Micro means less. Um, so then it just says that you have albumin leakage, which is not normal, but you don't have as much leakage. So that is when you have an ACR ratio between 30 to 300 milligrams per mil. And then when you actually have kidney damage, which is when the whole meshwork sort of falls apart and you're leaking way too much albumin, then that ratio increases. So as you can see, albumin is the numerator. So when you have a higher numerator, the ACR ratio goes up. And so over 300 milligrams per mil is when we call it to be um, a kidney damage. Okay, so we'll just go on um, to talk a little bit about uh, the kidney diseases that people experience. Um, next slide, please. Um, so basically the difference between acute versus chronic is acute is something that happens suddenly, whereas chronic is something that's happening over a gradual period of time. Um, next slide, please. So we'll start off by saying um, the acute kidney injury, also known as AKI. Um, and this is when you have a sudden decline in the glomerular filtration rate or the GFR. Um, this occurs because, you know, you have a sudden loss of kidney function. So uh, the acute kidney injury can, you know, it can be reversible if, you know, you do the prompt treatment um, of the underlying cause, such as fluids for dehydration or removal of a nephrotoxin. Uh, or conversely, it can also be life-threatening because of the fluid overload or because of electrolyte um, disturbances that, you know, require dialysis. Many cases of AKI occur in patients hospitalized for unrelated um, acute illnesses. So there are many causes of AKI. It can occur because there's a drop in blood pressure or there's an interruption of blood flow to the kidneys from a severe injury or illness. It can also be caused because there's direct damage to the kidney by an inflammation or a toxin or a drug, even an infection or, like I said, reduced blood supply. And another reason is because um, of urinary tract obstruction. So this is when you have blocked urine flow. And this can all lead to or is usually associated with the development of chronic kidney disease. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the AKI symptoms, um, again, it can go from, you know, low to no urine volume, edema, confusion. But um, most patients actually have no symptoms, so they're actually asymptomatic when it comes to AKI. And in terms of diagnosis, um, it, it, AKI leads to elevations in the serum creatinine, the blood urea nitrogen, and the electrolyte levels. So basically, you would measure all, all of those in order to identify AKI. 
And in terms of treatments, um, treatment options depend on what's causing the kidney failure, and usually they are reversible. Um, these treatments are to balance you know, the amount of fluids in your blood. So for example, if there is swelling, then, then that's because there's too much fluid in the body, and so therefore the doctor might recommend a diuretic in order to get rid of all that fluid. Or if there is a lack of fluid, then it's, it's because of a, they will usually administer an IV fluid. Uh, medications can also, you know, be used to control your potassium levels in the blood, especially because the kidneys aren't working properly in order to filter the potassium from the blood. And there's also medications to restore your blood calcium levels. And if the kidney is not functioning properly, then um, dialysis is also an option, which we go um, over a little um, in the presentation later. Next slide, please. And then we go into the chronic kidney injury, also known as CKD. And this stands for, um, basic, this is basically when you have the permanent loss of kidney function. So it is defined when you know you have um, a presence of kidney damage or a decreased GFR that is greater than three months. And because the kidney is responsible for filtering waste and excess fluids from your blood, CKD is going to be the gradual loss of the kidney function. And this then leads to dangerous levels of fluids, electrolytes, and waste that builds up in your body. In terms of risk factors, um, there are factors that increase the risk of getting CKD, which include, which include obesity, age, your smoking history, as well as previous cardiovascular disease. And causes could be uh, diabetes, your high blood pressure, and inflammation of the kidney tubules or surrounding structures, um, maybe a genetic disorder of the kidneys, um, some sort of prolonged obstruction of the urinary tract, or a recurrent kidney infection. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of symptoms, these uh, those with CKD will witness things from nausea, edema, you know, decrease in output, things that are very similar with AKI, um, but many patients usually show no clinical symptoms. And in terms of diagnosis, you can do blood tests in order to, again, see the creatinine and the urea levels. You can also do urine tests in order to reveal any sort of abnormalities. Um, there's also imaging tests that can be done in order to assess kidney structures as well as size. And you can also remove um, uh, a sample of the kidney's tissue, also known as a kidney biopsy. And in terms of treatments, there are, again, various medications, um, again, to control the high blood pressure, the lower cholesterol levels, treat any sort of anemia, relieve swelling, or protect the bones. Um, and in order to reduce your risk of developing kidney disease, you want to maintain a healthy um, weight, you know, exercise, maintain a healthy diet. And um, not smoke because, you know, cigarette smoking can damage kidneys or make existing kidney damage even worse. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, Dr. Fernio alluded to this a little while ago um, when he talks about drinking water. Um, water is definitely really great and it's very important that we stay very well hydrated. Um, as it was identified in acute kidney injuries, like if you are dehydrated, that can lead to an acute kidney injury and that is easily reversible by drinking fluids. Um, however, there's always a confusion about how much water people need to drink, especially people who have chronic kidney disease. Um, and so acutely drinking water can help increase your renal clearance. So it helps to clean out a lot of your toxins. So it improves your GFR um, acutely, which is great. Um, however, the amount of water that you need to drink every day beyond how much you feel thirsty for it has not really shown any be benefits compared to people who just have a normal consumption of water based on when they feel like when they feel thirsty or when they feel like drinking. So um, I guess like the current research shows that it is very important to stay well hydrated. However, there is no fixed amount of water that you need to consume. It's very variable dependent on the patients. It's dependent on your um, gender, your body weight, uh, your dis the diseases that you might have, the different medications you might be taking. So if you feel um, thirsty, always have water. Don't dehydrate yourself. Something like if you are, if you know you're going to work out, if you're going to go out for a bike ride, a walk, anything like that in the heat, you have to make sure that you stay well hydrated. Um, if you're even going to do exercises at home, things like that are very important to keep in mind. But there's no real 
magic amount of water that you have to drink, which will help people with chronic disease. Dr. Kony, did you have anything to add about the... No, I think you covered it really well. So one of the things is that, you know, it, with, uh, we learned about you can injure your, your kidneys by, by dehydration, um, and you can certainly um, decrease your performance by being dehydrated and heat stroke, etc. But there was a, a randomized trial that actually gave supplemental water to people and people with chronic renal dysfunction to hope that would slow down the progression of the, of the damaging of the nephrons. Fortunately, that trial did not show benefit. So I think you're right, is that uh, water is a good, healthy food. There is actually randomized data suggesting people who are trying to lose weight that having two glasses of water at the start of your every meal, so six glasses of water a day, helps lose weight. And so there, there's data to that support. So um, I think it's just, we talked a little bit about the, the sad man approach and when you get sick, drink water, avoid dehydration because when you're dehydrated, bad things happen to you. So uh, water is not magical, it's a great healthy food. And uh, sometimes we oversell water. Um, uh, some places you can get extra oxygenated water if you want to, but I don't think that's going to really show you much benefit. So drink water, a good beverage. Um, and if water is replacing, you know, uh, uh, too many calories, sugared water, um, water, water, water. Um, it's, a, it's a good food, but it's not magical. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I guess we can move on to the next slide then. Okay, um, so intensive ACE inhibitors. So basically ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme, um, where ACE inhibitors are actually responsible for relaxing the vein um, and arteries by basically dilating them. So they, they increase their surface area um, in order to lower your blood pressure. Um, there are many ACE inhibitors available, and the best one depends on your health and other factors. Um, for example, those with CKD actually benefit from ACE inhibitors as one of their medications. And, you know, some common examples of ACE inhibitors are Ramipril and Vasotec. So basically, how do they work? Um, so ACE inhibitors will block your body from producing a chemical uh, called angiotensin II. And angiotensin II enters you. So basically what angiotensin do to does is it enters the bloodstream and it vasoconstricts your blood uh, your blood vessels so it makes them narrower and this then makes your blood have less space to move in and travel which therefore increases your blood pressure so this narrowing can lead to high blood pressure and force your heart to work at a, a much harder so angiotensin can also trigger a hormone that um that makes your body retain water so having more fluids in your body in a restricted space um, will then also cause your blood pressure to rise. So what the ACE inhibitor does is that it actually prevents um, the angiotensin from being produced, angiotensin 2 from being produced, and this then lowers your blood pressure altogether. Um, so your blood vessels are able to, you know, relax and widen, and it makes um, it easier for the blood to flow through. And it also uh, lowers the amount of water that your body retains, which then lowers your blood pressure. Um, when are they used? So your ACE inhibitors will help um, prevent, treat, and even improve symptoms and conditions such as high blood pressure, um, heart diseases, diabetes, CKD, and other medications prescribed with the ACE inhibitors are usually diuretics. Um, next slide, please. So the three ACE inhibitions oh. I use the most are um, Ramacryl or Altase, Corindapro or Covercil, and Mavic or Trendolopril, those are the three big ones that I tend to use a lot of because they have longer half-lives and they're, 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 they're good medications. So they lower blood pressure, but they have these extra protective effects to both the heart, kidney, and brain. So very, very, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. Um, and then on the other side, we have ARBs, which are angiotensin II receptor blockers. And these are also medications that will block the action of angiotensin II. Um, some of the common ARBs are Darby, Candesardin, Valsardin, and Micardis. Um, so basically, how do they work? Uh, they will prevent uh, angiotensin II from binding to the angiotensin II receptor on the muscles that surround the blood vessels. So as a result, the blood vessels then enlarge or dilate, and the blood pressure is then reduced. The reduced blood pressure, again, makes it easier for the heart to pump blood, 
and it can then improve um, heart failure. In addition to uh, the progression of the kidney disease caused by the high blood pressure and diabetes is slowed by the ARBs. ARBs have an effect that is similar to the ACE inhibitors, but the ACE inhibitors, they act on preventing the formation of angiotensin II altogether. Whereas the ARBs, they will produce um, angiotensin II, but they will prevent them from binding onto their receptors that are present on the muscles of the blood vessels. And uh, these ACE inhibitors um, aren't taken with the ARB. So if you're prescribed an ARB, then you won't be taking an ACE inhibitor. Um, the uses of a ARBs are basically they're used to control your high blood pressure, treat heart failure, and prevent future kidney failure in, in people with diabetes or high blood pressure. Um, ARBs also may prevent diabetes and reduce the risk of stroke in patients with high blood pressure or an enlarged heart. And ARBs may also prevent the reoccurrence of atrial fibrillation. Since ARBs medications have effects that are similar to those of ACE inhibitors, they're often used with ACE inhibitors. They're often used when the ACE inhibitors are not tolerated by patients. So both are never used together. So what's really important is that, you know, when ACE or ARB therapy, so ARB, such as we talked about, uh, candesartin, valsartan, herbisartan, are like ACE without the cough. So they block the same pathway slightly different place. And many people say, well, I don't have high blood pressure. Well, you may or may not know your blood pressure, but they're used independently of blood pressure because they block hormones that are potentially harmful in high levels. So uh, um, so, so think about that, uh, why you're uh, taking medications. And we're going to explore medications in a great detail in a future webinar. I'm, you know, this, I call this medical school for, for, for patients and uh, we're going to make doctors of you all as time goes on. It's really important to understand this. And like any good doctor, you doctor yourself, is that you have to monitor, you have to manage, and you have to, you have to measure things. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Um, next slide. So um, why does taking ACE inhibitors and ARBs initially reduce the EGFR? Um, so angiotensin II, like I mentioned, is responsible for constricting or narrowing um, the efferent arterial of the glomerulus. So this efferent vasoconstriction then increases the pressure which, uh, to impede the blood flow. So it decreases the amount of blood flow out of the glomerulus so the uh, glomerular filtration rate or the GFR can be maintained. So when patients are given the ACE inhibitors or the ARBs, the angiotensin II formation and effect is diminished, right? They're not made at all. And so the GFR may decrease as this protective blood flow mechanism is completely blocked. Um, these effects can be avoided by, you know, having a slow dose titration or managed with um, dose decreases or discontinuation. <coughs> Did you want to add anything else, Dr. Kerner? So I understand this is this is for the um, biochemist and us. So, but what you should know as a patient when you get an ACE or ARB therapy, your GFR or your or the, like your kidney function, will decrease by between 5 and up to 25% acutely. Um, it's not because the kidneys are getting worse, it's that just that the pressure inside each glomerular, those 2 million glomerulars are, are being decreased. So by decreasing the pressure, it de makes the GFR go down, makes your kidney function look worse acutely. But what you're really doing is changing the pressure inside of it, and you're preserving renal function. So one of the biggest mistakes I see, um, you go on one of these life-saving medications and your kidney function, your creatinine goes up or your GFR goes down a little bit, you panic, you stop. No, you don't panic. You don't stop. You keep it going. It's expected to fall. Uh, it's expected to affect the, the kidneys acutely. As we showed initially, uh, these, these drugs actually decrease the need for dialysis uh, down the road. They don't get rid of the need, but they decrease the need for dialysis. And if you have a bad heart systolic dysfunction, these medications are very important to try and make your heart stronger. So um, um, the only downside of these medications are that they can cause the potassium to go up, and that's why we have to monitor the potassium, and that's why you need to have blood work. Um, so uh, that's what I'm selling to people right now is that, you know, what to decide when to monitor uh, and um, when to measure. So know your blood pressure, know your weight, and we can t decide together when we should go for blood work. Thank you. Next slide. Okay. okay. Um, so then, 
We're shifting gears a little bit. Um, so we'll talk about diabetes and in relation to kidney disease next. Um, so diabetes, as we alluded to before, is one of the major contributors to chronic kidney disease. Um, so much so that the most common cause of end-stage renal failure in North America is diabetes. And 50% people with diabetes will eventually get kidney disease. Um, so it is really important um, that we have a bell control diabetes, especially your glucose levels, because it then uh, directly impacts how your kidneys are functioning. So as we mentioned before, albumin is a protein which leaks through your kidney when we have kidney damage. So albumin is a good indicator that your kidneys are getting damaged if you're seeing a lot of albumin in your urine. So how they usually classify it is microalbuminuria, which is only a little bit additional albumin leaking out. That's usually between 0 to 300 milligrams daily. Macro is when you have more than 300 milligrams. And then proteinuria is when you have over 500 milligrams daily. And so usually microalbuminuria is your first indication that the kidney is getting damaged. And then if it is not well controlled and just over time, things can get worse. So usually it is predicted that within the next 7 to 10 years, the kidney function will decline by 50%. Usually we start therapy when people have diabetes and kidney disease. And so for that, you start ACE inhibitors and the ARBs um, that we talked about previous in the previous slides. Um, yeah, so it is very important, as I mentioned, to have well-controlled diabetes to prolong kidney disease from occurring as much as possible. So what's interesting is that diabetes has become more common as we're learning about kidney disease is getting worse. And we're saying that about 50% of people who have type 2 diabetes will eventually get kidney disease. And the best early detector of kidney disease is like looking for the oil leaking in your from your from your car it is proteinuria, and that usually occurs seven to ten years before you have sizable declines in kidney function. So you can see that you how you can monitor the progress of this over time. Remember, most people feel do not feel sick when you have kidney disease. It's not till it's far advanced. Remember that 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 that. Uh, story we shared about the gentleman who had end-stage renal disease went for was on dialysis for a couple of years before his kidney transplant. He was very sick towards the last few years of his life or before transplantation. Uh, dialysis helped a bit, but he didn't feel as well as he'd wanted to, is that most people with kidney disease um, won't die of their kidney disease. They'll die of usually heart disease. Um, and so we need to understand that, and we know there's a very strong relationship. What I learned is that having bad kidneys means that you have very high incidence of heart disease, uh, and we need to really worry about that, so uh, to protect that. And as you well pointed out, is that the risk factors from weight, smoking, blood pressure are extremely important for the kidneys, the heart, and other, other vascular or circulation territories. So... Uh, um, um, so I'm going to go for a run later. I'm going to go for up the stairs. I'm going to try to get that to that 165 pound magic for me. So I'm, I'm going to keep working at it. I know how difficult it is, but I'm not mad at myself for not being successful. I'd be mad at myself for not trying. And I get mad at you for not trying. If you try, that's all I can ask for and try differently. And you can see, uh, and so we don't want to wait till your kidneys are at that 10% function before you do something. Now situations just way too late. Thank you. Um, next slide. So we can continue to talk a little bit more about um, diabetic kidney disease and how that impacts your cardiovascular system. So as Dr. Kofanyu was mentioning, um, if your kidneys are not working too well, that has a direct impact on your heart. So here, um, if you look at the first graph on the left side, um, the BN in the top corner says diabetic nephropathy, which means that diabetic kidney disease, your kidneys are getting damaged because you've had chronic diabetes. Um, and so it, this bottom line frequency suggests how many people with the diseases can have impact on their cardiovascular outcomes. So 50% people with diabetic kidney disease um, are are said to have some form of cardiovascular damage. Um, so here we can clearly see how 
kidney disease can affect cardiovascular um, system. And then on the right, we see how the number, number of years lost to life um, can be calculated based on your total kidney function. So here it says that um, as people's age increases and you have chronic kidney disease, then you lose the number of years to your life. And that occurs more in people who also have vascular diseases. So if you're if diabetes is damaging your kidneys, which uh, together is essentially having an impact on your heart, then that overall leads to a greater loss of years to life. Um, move on to the next slide. Um, and these are essentially all the risk factors that we talked about initially. So um, traditionally, we thought that um, common risk factors like older age, a family history of diabetes or heart diseases, hypertension, so high blood pressure, um, dyslipidemia, so increase in lipid levels or tobacco use, which is smoking, essentially has a huge impact on both kidneys and heart. But now we are seeing that there's a whole bunch of other factors that can still have an influence on your kidney. So in addition to all the things that we already talked about, there's multiple different things which can impact your kidney function. And therefore, it's very important that all the factors which are in our control, we try to manage them the best. So things like... Um, Increase in your sympathetic system activity, things like anemia. So if you have iron deficiency or if you have vitamin D deficiency, if you have increased calcification in your artery, so when you have blocks inside your artery, inflammation, things like that also have a huge impact on both your kidneys and heart and they ultimately contribute to increasing cardiovascular risk. So a lot of the factors are, thing, so inflammation and things like that, you cannot directly control, but you can indirectly control that by having um, well-managed hypertension, well-managed diabetes, eating healthy, um, trying to exercise, avoiding smoking, avoiding alcohol. All of those things trigger inflammation. And chronic inflammation, as we can see here, is one of the newer factors which has identified to have huge impacts on both kidneys and heart. And so it's very important that we try to control all those underlying factors which are in our control so that we don't have to go through other factors that can potentially damage our organs. And so this just essentially highlights how both inflammation and calcification. So calcification is, again, buildup of that plaque inside your arteries and blood vessels. They can both together help in increasing the cardiovascular risk. So um, we have tried to identify that these both factors damage organs. And so a lot of new treatments which are coming out are um, based off of targeting these two mechanisms. So we are trying to target both chronic inflammation, so different pathways that can cause inflammation, and we're trying to limit that as well as we're trying to limit different things that can increase calcification. Um, and both of those together, um, if we try to reduce them, then we ultimately might be able to reduce cardiovascular risk. But this is very new research. This is more important for highlighting that these are different factors and that we have different things that can potentially help us with it, although we don't know for sure how that can impact overall risk. So a couple, thing, couple things that I'm learning about inflammation is that inflammation can be harmful to the heart, to the brain, um, and also to the immune system. And what I'm learning is that being overweight gives you that, that belly fat that was very, a lot of cytokines are very inflammatory. You can see most, most chronic kidney disease, heart disease, Blocked arteries are very inflammatory, lots of inflammation. As we get older, um, we're fighting more inflammation. And one of the theories right now about you know, vaccines, we're all waiting for a coronavirus vaccine. But reality is that vaccines don't work as well in older people. Uh, they don't work as well from shingles, influenza, and probably won't work as well for coronavirus. So if you're waiting for that magical vaccination, um, we, we, we have a problem because they're, not, they're, they're now being tested in younger people who have who have a better immune system and will function better. And as we get older, we have more chronic inflammation. 
and inflammation causes our immune system to fight this, and it gets taxed and it downregulates. So what I'm trying to do is get my immune system to work better. Well, I can't prove it. I think losing weight decreases markers of inflammation, makes me feel better. Um, so um, I, I'm thinking right now in this room to everybody who's worried about uh, their health is one way to decrease inflammation is to become more active and lose weight and not smoke. I know it sounds so basic we come back to this because the people who are going to require the vaccine the most protection, it's going to be the least effective. Um, so um, we have a problem here. So decrease your inflammation. Don't get sick. Don't get old. But if you do get old, you can reverse it partially by exercise and activity. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, when I'm exercising, yes, I'm achy, but I, I, I feel more alive. And uh, one of the things I, I want to thank Dino and others for um, um, this COVID pandemic, because we're out, we're out there playing squash with the birds, the sunrise, sunset. It's just so wonderful. Um, it's a wonderful feeling. So it may not make me live longer. I think it will, but it makes me feel better. And, and that's good for my immune system. And it's good for my inflammation. And as we saw before, and you'll see again, is that uh, once the disease is far advanced, lots of inflammation, it's hard to put the brakes on that. So the longer you wait, the harder it gets. Uh, it just means that uh, you just have to start work harder at it and work gradually at it. But we can all get better. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, yes. So um, just talking more about um, trying to reduce that cardiovascular risk. So for sure, um, we should always all try to be um, striving for lifestyle changes. And that continues regardless of the treatment regimens that we're given. So even if you're taking medications, it's very important to continue on with lifestyle. Um, but there's still some medications that have shown to help reduce cardiovascular risk in patients who have diabetic kidney disease. Um, so two of those drugs that we'll talk about today are SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, so things that you might have heard um, them called as Zigduo for Ziga or Jardians, um, and then GLP-1 receptor agonists. So the first ones, the SGLT2 inhibitors, they've shown a dramatic reduction in treatment and prevention of heart failure and progression of renal disease, including the need for transplantation and dialysis. So as Dr. Kurnew was saying earlier, dialysis is a very neat process. However, it is a very difficult process to go through for everyone, for the patients, for the healthcare providers, even for our system. So it's very important that we do not try to, uh, that we try to avoid them as much as possible. And for that, we have multiple medications as well as a combination of lifestyle factors as shown to be really helpful. The next group of um, drugs that, have shown benefit in reduction in the cardiovascular risk of the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, so these help with reduction in body weight, reduce hypertension, reduce hyperglycemia. Um, so we said how body weight, hypertension, increased glucose levels have all shown to influence um, increase in cardiovascular risk. So when you have reduction of all of those, then essentially your cardiovascular risk also decreases. Um, then these drugs have also shown to decrease proteinuria. So again, it helps with increase, uh, bettering your kidney function, but does not change your end-stage renal disease. So, so it will be coming on, but this just helps with prolonging it as well as helping improve your cardiovascular risk. So the way I think about it, if you have brand new type 2 diabetes, if you lose 20 pounds and keep it off for two years, you can put diabetes into remission in about half the people. Um, now, when as, it, as diabetes goes on, there's more damage to the nephrons. We're going to need better lifestyle changes, which are more challenging, and also medications. Um, and the first line medication for most of us in diabetes is, is metformin. And what should be the second agent? It really has lots of factors. But if you're at risk for kidney disease, um, you know, we talked about ACE, ARB therapy. Either one of those two will help decrease the progression to end-stage renal disease by about 20 25% or so. Adding an SGL2 receptor antagonist helps prevent or delay heart failure and treat heart failure. Um, and 
it's been a dramatic breakthrough for, for, for kidney function. Um, so you're, you're going to see that many people who have diabetes at risk for heart failure, you should be on that category of medications. We have one trial and a second trial to be released in, uh, in, this, in, in August will show that uh, uh, one of the SPL2 receptor antagonists called Jardians has uh, shown value in treatment of heart failure and uh, in people outside of the diabetes field. Um, we already learned that uh, uh, for Zika, also outside the diabetes field, it's, it's protective for, for heart failure and for the kidneys as well. So very exciting times right now. Now the GLP agonists, again, we have lots of talks on diabetes. You can see how the kidneys, the, the heart, the pancreas are all intertwined and very important. These drugs I use for uh, good control of blood sugar, and they're the most powerful agents to help promote weight reduction. So Ozempic is a prime example of one of the glucon agonists. I think about for, for weight management, for kidney protection, I think of SGL2 receptor antagonists. For heart failure, I think of the SGL2 receptor antagonists. So you can see we have lots of choices and lots of things going on here. And yes, it's confusing, but that, that's my job um, to help try to train the confusion a little bit. And you need to start learning about these things, and you have to see, are these medications right for you um, with diabetes or not? Because diabetes is the leading cause of end-stage kidney failure. So I think that's really important to realize that. And, um, and we have really some, some really advances. I'm not saying that lifestyle changes aren't important, but the, the more advanced the disease, the more the lifestyle changes. Um, let's, let's, let's move on. Thank you for showing that. And so this is actually the Credence trial. So um, this is actually a, a trial with Invercano, another one of the SGL2 receptor antagonists. This trial looked at patients who had advanced or moderately advanced kidney disease that were leaking protein. They were already on the best therapy to start off with. And what this drug showed is that it, it helped all outcome measurement. You can see there's always a separation in these curves at about a couple of years. Um, and it shows that a period of two years and over long periods of time, you actually protect the kidneys, you protect the heart, you make yourself live longer. So this is a remarkable breakthrough. And uh, uh, we're going to have many more trials outside the diabetes field as well as the diabetes fields to show this. So this is, to me, a landmark trial. The SGL2 receptor in this in this case was in Vitano. We have... We have uh, three agents and possibly four agents available uh, in this category right now to, to choose from. So uh, wonderful times for, uh, for prevention and treatment. Uh, next slide, please. And what I really want to show you on this next slide here is that if you look at the bottom curve, you can see in that uh, yellowish color that if you're on placebo, you can see that your kidney function declines over time. And if you go on um, an SGL2 receptor antagonist, you have initial dip in your kidney function. Can we show a, um, a, um, an, an arrow there in some way? Can, can someone show us? Oh, yeah. So if you look down the bottom slide here, let's go to the bottom, the bottom one over here. You can see that the initial decline in renal function is progressive on placebo. And if you went on an SGL2 receptor antagonist, you can see in that blue line, initial dip in kidney function. So, oh, my kidney function is getting worse. Well, you're decreasing the pressure inside the kidneys because you're, 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 you're affecting the environment of that kidney. We think it decreases something called interstitial fluid. And it shows by a year that the people on Invercano or the SPW have a clear protection. And this actually translates to a reduction in need for dialysis long term. Same thing with ACE or therapy. These, these numbers of kidney function, GFR, are very sensitive to, to how much hydration you have, how much fluid you have on board. So I can make anybody's kidney function look terrible by just dehydrating, starving you, not getting anything to drink. Now your kidney function will get worse. And uh, so very important that you work with people who understand this, and you must understand this as well. You're going to see a lot of fluctuation in your kidney function. That's why you need to have to have multiple sets of lab values to look at this over time. And what kidney doctors have told me 
is look at the rate of decline of your kidney function. That's by multiple blood work to, to help us that. So we use protein, albumin to help impart how much leakage, and also the GFR, but you have to put this into context. This is, this is, this is incredible information. We have many strategies to help. Um, and when you have advanced kidney disease, unfortunately, lifestyle changes are not sufficient. Lifestyle changes are before you get these problems and more early in the process. It's never too late to be healthier, but the maximum benefit of being healthy is the day you're born. Um, and so um, keep thinking about this. So uh, I'm not sure if any of our experts here want to give some more opinion on this, but I find this really, really amazing information that we have so many strategies. It's not one strategy anymore. You can see that my job as a cardiologist, I become a kidney specialist, a lung specialist, a uh, um, part-time psychiatrist. Don't forget I had the couch in the office over here. Um, I'm a lousy psychiatrist, uh, but I'll, I'll give it my best shots and things of that nature. And uh, So I've learned a lot uh, as time goes on, but I also think about how we can prevent this onslaught of kidney dysfunction over time. And remember, is that one time we thought about, instead of measuring your heart function, just look at the amount of albumin in your urine to march your heart. And that's one way of looking at that, because what damages the kidneys also damages the heart as well. So they're all very, very much related. And, uh, um, and so it's not surprising, but same therapies can affect more than one organ system. It can protect the brain, the legs, the heart. Um, but you can see that uh, it all starts off with the basics of lifestyle changes and appropriate use of medication. So to me is that, well, none of us want to wear a mask. Um, I'm wearing a mask, and I can give you lots of protection to lots of organ systems uh, to start off with. So uh, thank you. Um, we'll get the next slide there. Okay. Um, so we've mentioned dialysis quite a few times. Um, exactly what is it? So we know that, you know, a properly functioning kidney prevents extra water, waste, and other impurities from accumulating in our body. Um, they also help control our blood pressure and regulate the levels of chemical elements, such as, you know, sodium and potassium in the blood. Um, and your kidneys can even activate a form of vitamin D that improves the absorption of calcium. But when the kidneys aren't able to perform these functions due to, you know, a disease or maybe even an injury, um, dialysis can help keep the body running um, as normally as possible. Um, so without dialysis, these salts and other waste products will basically accumulate in the blood and um, they will poison the blood and they will damage all the other organs as well. Um, however, just remember, you know, dialysis isn't a cure for kidney disease or other problems affecting the kidneys and different treatments are required or may be needed in order to address these concerns. Um, one of the most common types of dialysis is hemodialysis, and this is when, you know, this process uses an artificial kidney to remove waste and extra fluid from the blood. Um, the blood is removed from the, from the body and filtered through the artificial kidney, and then that filtered blood is then again returned to the body with um, the help of a dialysis machine. In order to avoid ever getting to the stage of where you need to have dialysis, um, usually it's by maintaining two conditions, which is your high blood pressure or diabetes, because they are one of the most common causes of kidney failure. Um, and this, to do this, you, it, would, it would be basically by managing your blood sugar levels, managing your blood pressure, maintaining a healthy weight, um, eating a heart-healthy diet, limiting any of your alcohol intakes and not smoking, as well as exercising regularly. Next slide, please. So I haven't seen too many people enjoy dialysis, but it's um, it's, uh, it's it's sort of like, do you want to be uh, want to be dead or alive? And for some people, it's just it's so it's wonderful. It makes such a huge difference in their quality of life. For other people, it prolongs their suffering, and uh, so we always make a very difficult decision about this. It's okay to say no to dialysis if you had a lot of suffering if you have you know you've had amputations you lost a lot of loved ones your kidneys don't work your heart doesn't work and you've been suffering in a lot of pain from arthritis remember um these are all chronic medical conditions that, uh, that add to this so for the right person dialysis is wonderful for the wrong person it prolongs suffering so it's something you have to i you know you have to think a lot hard about this so um 
uh, these are things to think about. And uh, once you're on dialysis, your life expectancy is not very long in, in, in Ontario um, because all the other organs are, are also failing as well. We can certainly help the kidneys um, uh, or help getting rid of the, the waste products of the kidneys and help some of the other factors. But uh, your kidneys do more than just waste products. They control an anemia. So you're going to need something called erythropoietin. You don't use iron properly. You're going to need vitamin D. You're going to have to handle calcium and phosphate metabolism differently. Uh, you will have lots of encounters with the healthcare system and the team is that People on hemodialysis, on average, go three times a week. Uh, there's another form called peritoneal dialysis. And, of course, uh, for those special people that uh, can get kidney transplant, uh, wonderful as well. So we have very effective therapies. So what I'm going to try to do is while you may not in diabetes, you may, you may not be able to totally avoid dialysis, but you can certainly delay uh, when that happens to you if you, if you have kidney disease uh, from all sorts, including diabetes. So we have marvelous therapies that uh, uh, delay the progression of end-stage renal disease. They don't help the disease. They don't reverse the disease. What they do is they decrease the progression of chronic kidney disease. Thank you for sharing that. Next slide. So that's actually all the slides I think they have. Well, you know, um, let's go back to the first slide of the day. Just um, 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 the, um, uh, just, just go to the next slide here. So um, this takes me to, uh, first of all, I want to thank these wonderful people that uh, really made such a difference in all our lives. Um, you guys have done a great job with this presentation. Um, you put together uh, a lot of work. Uh, special thanks to Stuart for uh, back behind the scenes. And we also know that uh, uh, we have Paul over here on the sidelines over here. Um, he came to the rescue today, and people come to the rescue all the time, is that uh, we all need help and work together. You can see that uh, the healthcare is now a healthcare team. Um, and there's no one person that can know everything, but we have to keep reading and learning. So I'm really grateful that I can, my brain still works good enough to, to absorb new information and share new things. You can see on the far right is that uh, my hope to everybody is that everybody gets a garden at some point in time and a bicycle and that would be two joys in life. Uh, remember, I think during the war time, 30% of fruits and vegetables were grown locally, and so I hope we get back to that. I haven't seen too many gardeners who don't love the garden. Um, you can see on the far left, Judy is going to be starting uh, uh, her training as a, as a young physician, and uh, she carries the book, 30 Days to a Healthier You, and so that book reminds me it's the work of so many people, and I thank them all for participation. And um, what you need to do is do that book 30 times, 3 million times. So we have 2 million nephrons. Um, maybe you should do this 30 times, 2 million times, and that, and that, that will help as well. In the middle, we see the merger of young and older people working together. Um, and, and then we see, you know, sharing food. Food is so, such a joyous uh, event. And uh, one of my favorites is uh, sushi and uh, and. Uh, and and I have to watch the carbohydrates and look and things of nature. So I learned a lot today about the kidneys. So, so I know that the kidneys and the heart are intertwined and that most individuals, so we have 10% of people who have chronic renal disease, that disease is skyrocketing, uh, that uh, diabetes, lowering blood sugar helps a bit, lifestyle changes helps a bit. We have very specific medications that delay the progression of uh, diabetes, and those are ARBs, ACE inhibition, blood pressure control, and lipids help a little bit, by, but they help for the kidneys, but help a lot from, from the heart. Now we have new tools, SGL2 receptor antagonists that really protect against heart failure um, and uh, protect the kidneys. Glucagon agonists decrease proteinuria, and more importantly, they're very strong medications to help promote weight reduction. So we've learned a lot, and these are the, and uh, I'm sure everybody's head is quite sore. There's lots of information. So my advice to you is know your GFR. Uh, learn to understand that. And those who have diabetes, you might want to know about your proteinuria. Uh, family doctors do a wonderful job of looking at that. And if the kidney function is really bad, then that, then you need to see the help of a, a nephrologist. But 
be honest is that a lot of kidney function can be helped by your cells by monitoring and also if you get sick the sad man so if you're dehydrated you have to stop certain medications for a period of time so you'll have to stop some of the diabetes medications such as sulfonylureas dimicron you have to put your Invercano for Zika, Jardins on hold for a few days. If your blood pressure is too low, you stop your blood pressure pills for short periods of time, especially ACE or B therapy, because potassium can go shooting up and can be a very serious consequence, and even deaths is not properly looked after. Um, so monitor your health. Um, uh, but we have so many life saving medications, and you know, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to serve and to get better. And it's so wonderful seeing all these younger people taking over. Uh, I want to congratulate you on a job well done. Um, are there any questions or comments from the audience today there, Stuart? I know this is a very technical one. It's going to be hard for people to understand, but uh, that's okay. You're going to listen to this four or five times, and I'm going to listen to this four or five times again. Um, Every time I learn this, I have lots to learn, though. So was there any comments there, Stuart? Uh, no no uh, questions on YouTube and no questions in the WebEx either. So, so one of the take-home messages that the good news is if you have chronic kidney disease is that you're probably not going to die from your kidney disease. You're going to die from usually heart disease. Uh, there are steps you can make, but if, if need be, uh, dialysis and transplantation are options for some. Um, and that I'm going to really work hard on, on prevention. And uh, I want to wish everybody a, a, a great week, weekend, and um, uh, find ways to be healthier. And uh, Stuart, like always, you get the last word. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I think as Doctor mentioned, the really cool thing about cardiology is you learn a little bit about everything, and so you become many doctors yourself. Uh, I think the takeaway message here today is to take an active approach to your own health. Uh, I know today was a very technical lesson. There's a lot of terms that you may not remember, and that's why it's always good to go back and watch these videos again. Um, but also, if you're ever in the clinic, uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, if you want to know what something means in your blood work, ask us. Uh, ask us volunteers. Ask doctor. We would love to share it with you. Uh, we'd love to help you take an active approach in your health. And so uh, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I'd like to thank uh, Devanshi and uh, Janavi for our, a, an incredible presentation today. So um, I think that's everything I have to say. I just think today was really a really educational and really informative lesson, and I learned a lot myself. So, uh, wonderful! I think you, you said well. Is that uh, what I hope these series of webinars become to people are resources, and people go back and look at that. I encourage you to get friends and others to to look at these things and learn. Um, uh, learning takes time and effort, and um, and that's okay. And uh, we're going to learn together. We're going to get better together. Um, John Deacon, I'm going to win that bet, I hope. I have to get to 165 pounds before you get to uh, your 10 pounds lighter. So I don't know if I'm going to win or not. But uh, right now is that I'm going to do 30 days at a time. I'm going to get healthier each and every day. And I uh, uh, hope some of the resources that we provide are, are helpful to you in a small way. So I want to wish everybody a, a wonderful weekend. I want to thank our our presenters, um, fantastic job. Um, um, I look forward to uh, what you're going to show us next week and uh, have a great week. So I just want to just say thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to let you go at this point in time, and some of us are just going to stay on and just uh, sort of uh, do a little brainstorming and stuff in nature. So you can stop recording at any time. Those who want to stay on with us are very welcome. Um, Thank you again, and have a good week, and hope to see you uh, a little bit healthier next week. All right, what do you guys think? That was great.